uh, thanks a lot, Norbert, and thanks to all of you for staying around for the very last talk of the workshop. Uh, uh, so this is based on joint work with, uh, mostly based on joint work with Aditya Bhaskara, who is faculty at uh, University of Utah, Ida Chen, who's a PhD student of mine, and Iron Perold, who's currently a PhD student at Stanford, but he used to be an un undergrad at Northwestern, and he's very good, yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I know that this is the, the very last talk of the workshop. So I, I intend to spend a good chunk of my time just setting up the, you know, the context for the talk and the context for this topic and motivating it. And I'll get to, I hope to get to the main results. And if there is time, I'll get into some of the kind of techniques that I use to prove these kind of results. But I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I, I don't intend to cover a lot of technical material. So please uh, stop me whenever you want and, you know, ask questions because I know it's, yeah, it's been a long day and it's been a long week. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so let me actually start by just setting up the, I mean, just ensure that we are all on the same page by um, setting up notation and things. So in this talk, we'll be talking about tensors over reals. Okay. So we'll be focused on tensors of constant order and I'll use L to usually represent the order of the tensor. So typically I'll be thinking about L as being either three or four or six and so on, but generally constant order. Okay. And uh, uh, the dimension along each mode is going to be N and N is going to be very large and N tends to infinity. So, I mean, you want things to typically be, if you want it to be efficient, you want it to be polynomial in N, but uh, L is a constant. Okay, so the domain is reals again. Okay, so for example, this three cross three cross three, uh, sorry, this N cross N cross N tensor is, you know, what happens when you look at an order L tensor. Sorry, uh, when L order L is equal to three. Now, uh, in this talk, I'll be ma mainly focusing on CP decompositions of tensors. So uh, just, uh, yeah, so I'm sure you all know what this is, but uh, just to ensure we're on the same page, uh, we'll say that a tensor has a rank R decomposition, if it can be written as a sum of R rank one tensors. Okay, and the rank of the tensor is the smallest such R for which this is possible. In general, for order L tensors, because all the dimensions are N across all the modes, so the rank can go up to N to the L minus one. Okay. Uh, in this talk, we'll, I mean, just for convenience, we'll specifically focus on symmetric tensors, and we'll also focus on symmetric decompositions of these tensors. So, um, so for example, for L is equal to three, uh, you know, these AIs, BIs, and CIs, uh, sorry, BIs and CIs are the same as AI. So, I'll, I mean, so uh, these, it can be written as a sum of, you know, R rank one terms where the rank one term is just as a form some AI tensor thrice. Okay, so, um, so that's a symmetric rank R decomposition. And of course, uh, tensors have a lot of useful properties, but one property that will be particularly, that will be particularly useful for us is the fact that you know, these tensor decompositions, the lowest rank decomposition is typically unique, okay? Under either some mild conditions or under some, I mean, it's unique generically. For tensors of order three and above, for order two, it's not it's not true because it's a matrix and matrix decompositions are not unique, but order three onwards it is generically. And we'll, we'll often look at these kind of conditions when it holds. And in fact, we look at algorithms when we can actually find the lowest rank decomposition. Okay, so uh, again, uh, just for simplicity, I'm gonna assume even when I take order L tensors, I'm gonna assume that uh, it's a symmetric tensor and it has a uh, you know rank R decomposition. So it can be written as a sum of these AI tensor L times. Uh, note that this is not without loss of generality for even L. For odd L, it is without loss of generality. For even L, you I mean, ideally you want to also have a scalar which can take in negative numbers, but for, I mean, many of these results will also hold in that case, but um, you know, for this talk, we'll just focus on the simpler setting. Okay, uh, and we'll be interested in polynomial time algorithms, efficient algorithms to find the min rank decomposition. By this, by efficiency, I'll always mean just polynomial time. So we want it to be polynomial in the input size. So if it's an order L tensor, I just want it to be polynomial in n to the L. So that's n to the order L. Okay, so it's n to the some constant time self for some absolute constant c. Okay, and we'll be again looking at real arithmetic. 
uh, you can look at uh, finite precision arithmetic as well, and many of these results will go through because we'll care about robustness, but for simplicity, I'll just assume it's real arithmetic. Okay, and of course, finding a min rank decomposition is NP hard in the worst case. Okay, um, this is especially when the rank becomes larger than n. Okay, and uh, however, we do have many conditions under which you do have efficient algorithms. In particular, uh, you know we have a lot of efficient algorithms when the rank is at most n. This is often known as the undercomplete setting, and one such algorithm that we looked at, uh, I mean that people have described before, and uh, Ankur gave a very good talk about it, is, uh, is Yendrick's algorithm. Okay, so this is for order three tensors, and, and really it gives you an efficient algorithm for decomposing uh, such a, I mean, um, you know, a tensor when the factors of the decomposition, these vectors AIs, uh, which are the factors of the decomposition are linearly independent. Okay. Uh, so note that I mentioned the word recover the factors because uh, I mean, it's known that the decomposition is unique. In fact, it's unique even for much larger rank, even for three tensors, okay. Um, there are either explicit conditions or it holds generically. So, but certainly under this condition of linear independence, it's unique and you can recover it in polynomial time, okay. And uh, the only condition you need is that if you, if you write down this matrix M, where the columns of the matrix correspond to the factors of the decomposition. So it's an N cross R matrix where the vectors are in N dimensions and you have R columns corresponding to the R factors. You want this matrix to be linearly independent. Okay. But of course the rank can be much larger than N. And the question is what can we say about efficient algorithms in this over complete setting? So this is often, and at least in computer science, this is sometimes, this is sometimes known as the over complete setting. Okay, this is when the rank is much larger than n. And remember, even for three tensors, the rank can go up to n squared. For lth order tensors, you can go up to n to the l minus one. Okay, uh, this is NP hard in the worst case. So we'll be looking at conditions under which we can say something interesting. So these are beyond worst case settings. Okay, in particular, we'll look at condition. I mean, settings where there is a unique decomposition, and we'll look to recover it. Okay. Uh, so what can we say in the overcomplete setting? Well, actually there do exist efficient algorithms in the overcomplete setting, but only when the order is, I mean, the algorithms that we know of work when the order is much larger than three. So it's larger than three. So four and above, we do have algorithms that work even when the rank is larger than N. Okay, and many of these algorithms work generically. So what does it generically mean? It's, it's the algebraic geometry uh, uh, convention, which is to say that you know, uh, it it's holds generically if, uh, you know, it holds for all but a measure zero set of instances. Okay. So you're very unlikely to hit an instance where uh, this doesn't hold. Okay, so let's look at, for example, let's just look at a sixth order tensor and see why, I mean, in fact, Yendrick's algorithm itself gives you, uh, you know, allows you to handle rank larger than N. Okay, so let's look at a, a a sixth order tensor, and let's suppose it has this rank R decomposition given by AI tensor six times, summed over I going from one to R. Then what you can do is, well, one thing you can do is, is just a very simple trick. You can just think of AI tensor AI as itself as a, as a vector UI. Okay, so really what you're gonna do is you're gonna see the sixth order tensor as a third order tensor, okay? And you're gonna flatten it, okay? But if, when you do this flattening, really what you observe is that you can view it as this a third order tensor where the terms of the decomposition, you know, you can think of it as UI tensor thrice, but the UIs are exactly AI tensor twice. Okay, so you don't have, you know, now if you look at this matrix that you want it to be non-singular, okay, now instead of the columns being AI, now you have the columns being AI tensor twice, okay? So now you can just use Yendrick's algorithm on this flattened tensor and it's gonna work if the AI tensor twice are linearly independent. Okay, so you're looking at this matrix M where it has R columns, okay? The, R, the ith column is gonna be AI tensor twice. So that's actually a vector in, you know, in N squared dimensions, but really it's in N times N plus one over two dimensions. Okay, so you can really hope that, you know, uh, earlier, if the AIs were just in N dimensions, 
the best you can hope for is rank up to n because you want them to be linearly independent. But now you can hope for these vectors to be linearly independent even when r goes up to n times n plus one by two. Okay, and in fact, that is that holds generically. Okay, uh, but you can be a little more clever about this by using the fact fact that Gen Yendrick's algorithm doesn't just work for you know symmetric decompositions; it actually works for even when uh, you know the decomposition is not symmetric, and you can do different things along the different factors, and you can actually make it to work for rank going up to n to the l minus one over two, roughly. So for for Fifth order tensors, you can go up to n squared. For sixth order tensors, also n squared. For seventh order tensor, you can go up to uh, n cubed, and so on. Okay, so that's that's just by using Yendrick's algorithm. Okay, but just by doing this flattening and observing that you know you you should really expect the dimension to go up. Okay, but in fact, you could do something slightly better, and this is an uh, this is a beautiful algorithm, which is sometimes called the Fubi algorithm by uh, Cardoso and uh, Dela Tower and Castiang, okay, and uh, they give an algorithm to decompose fourth order tensors, okay, uh, generically, uh, up to rank going up to n squared, okay. So if you had used this Yendrick's algorithm, you'll only go up to n, but for fourth order tensors, you can actually go up to n squared. So this is more like n to the l over two, not l minus one over two. Okay, so you can actually do over complete tensor decomposition even for fourth order tensors. In polynomial time, but this is generic. I mean, this is this is generically true. There might be some worst case instances. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so we'll be interested in these kind of overcomplete settings as well. But before I go into further into tensor decompositions, we'll be interested in the concept of robustness for these decompositions. And let's look at just take a very slight detour and look into some of the motivation for these. I mean, how these tensor decomposition algorithms are used. So um, actually, just like we saw in the last talk, uh, and in fact, in many talks in the first uh, workshop, right? so tensor decompositions are used a lot in implementing the method of moments. So it's used for learning parameters of various probabilistic models, for example, mixtures of Gaussians uh, that was covered in the previous talk, but also hidden marker models, two-layer neural networks that was covered in wrong stock. Uh, in the first uh, uh, day of the workshop and so on. And in all of these cases, the, the key step is to, you know, think about some statistic of the model. So typically it corresponds to a, some moment or cumulant or something of this form where the, you'll, you'll, you'll do some clever process, I mean, processing on the uh, moments and you'll extract from it a tensor which has a low rank CP decomposition where each rank one term of the C CP decomposition encodes the moral parameters, okay? And then you can just try to run uh, off the shelf a black box algorithm for tensor decompositions. And if you, and uh, you know this, I mean, it has this rank one, you know, rank, uh, let's say if, if there are K parameters, K sets of parameters like K means, then uh, you'll have a rank K decomposition where the Kth term will be a rank one term, which will be, you know, sometimes it'll look quite nice. It, it may just be the parameter tensor three times. Sometimes it could look a little more messy and we will see that in, a little later for some more interesting models, okay? But it's just gonna be, a, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, you can use tensor decompositions and if you have uniqueness under some conditions, then this implies that the parameters are identifiable. There's only a unique set of parameters that explains your data. And if you do have an efficient algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm for tensor decompositions, then you also get an efficient learning algorithm. And that's a common template that's used in many, many works in uh, machine learning, uh, unsupervised learning, okay? And in fact, many of these learning problems are actually quite challenging in overcomplete settings when the rank becomes more than N. So here when the parameters becomes more than N, so you have more than K means and so on, and that really exactly corresponds to the tensor decomposition setting where the rank is much more than n. Okay, good. So, so this is how it's used in learning settings, but in any of these learning settings, one thing that's extremely important is that you never actually get this nice moment tensor exactly. You estimate this moment tensor from samples. Okay, so there's always sampling error. Okay, so for example, if you have N capital N samples from the model, every entry of the tensor can only be estimated up to some error that 
close like one over root n. Okay, so if you have polynomial in many samples, you only hope to estimate the tensor up to some inverse polynomial accuracy. Okay, so you should think about your tensor as having this really nice rank R decomposition plus some error tensor. And this error tensor has, you know, uh, may, I mean, you can assume that it has bounded norm, but you don't know much else about the error tensor, this adversarial. Okay, so the actual tensor may have much larger rank. The input tensor to you has much larger rank because the error tensor is, you don't have any control over it. Okay. Um, so you could think about maybe the, the right problem there to think about is really a low rank approximation problem where you're just trying to find the best rank R approximation to your tensor. Okay, so uh, you don't necessarily need the best rank R approximation as long as you get a very good rank R approximation, you're often happy. Okay, so you want an approximation which incurs a very small error. Okay, so in general, so, so really what you want are robust algorithms. And what I mean by robust is gonna be the following in this talk, which is that your algorithm needs to take polynomial time and it needs to be robust to inverse polynomial error. Okay, so why inverse polynomial? Because, I mean, you can try to parameterize ex exactly by the amount of error and get, get somewhat messy. But in general, in many of these learning applications, if you have polynomial samples, you can estimate all your tensors that you want up to some arbitrary inverse polynomial error. Okay, so I'm just, I just want my algorithms to be uh, robust to inverse polynomial error. Okay, any questions about this, about the setting or the goal? Okay, good. So let's look at some robust analogs of these classical results. Let's look at Yendrick's algorithm first. Well, Yendrick's algorithm you can actually show is robust up to this kind of inverse polynomial noise. Really the main condition that you want is not that the factor matrix that we looked at Earlier, we just wanted this factor matrix to be non-singular, or really you wanted to, all the columns to be uh, linearly independent or full rank. Now you actually need the minimum singular value of this matrix to be inverse polynomial. Or in other words, the condition number of this matrix to be inverse, I mean, to be at most polynomial. Okay, so we are gonna assume that the terms of the decomposition have bounded length. It doesn't need to be one, it's any polynomial bound is fine, but you just want the, uh, minimum singular value to be inverse polynomial. And this is something that's important to remember. Okay. Uh, and I mean, there are, I, I think this analysis actually is, is quite simple if you, if you know the original algorithms analysis, but if you do want this robust analysis, you can see some of these references, including Ankur Moitra's book. Uh, yeah. Okay. And in fact, you have these kind of robust analogs for even the Kruskal's uniqueness theorem, which I'm not going to go into. Okay. Um, but the question is, can you get these kind of robust analogs of these results in these overcomplete settings? Okay, this is Enric's algorithm that only works in the undercomplete setting when the rank is at most n. Okay, so let's look at what happens in just when we, you know, did this slight trick added to Enric's algorithm where we combined the factors and flattened it, right? So now, instead of requiring the factor matrix where you know the matrix of just A i is to be have minimum singular value, which is at least inverse polynomial n, you want this matrix that's formed by A i tensor twice to have a minimum singular value or sigma r to be at least inverse polynomial n. Okay, so now that's a little tricky to argue about because, okay, this is an explicit condition, but it's not easy to tell when you should expect this you know, these tensored powers of vectors, this matrix formed by tensored powers of vectors to have some minimum singular value, which is at least inverse polynomial. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, so we know that the, it is non-singular generically, but uh, yeah, I mean, so, but when can we say that the minimum singular value is at least inverse polynomial? Similarly, if you want a robust version of this FUBI algorithm, okay, uh, you want not necessarily this kind of a matrix, but in addition, you also want some other matrix that's formed by taking, you know, pairs of these vectors, raising something twice and tensoring it with another thing and, you know, subtracting it out. You form this matrix, okay, this is a slightly complicated matrix and uh, uh, where the columns correspond to these pairs, okay, and it's formed in a certain way. And again, you want this matrix to have its minimum singular value to be inverse polynomial. Okay, so the really the question is, 
when can we hope for these kind of conditions to be true? Okay, just like we want these conditions to be to, I mean, just like we know these conditions are true gen generically, uh, when you just care about non-singularity, that is, you know, you don't care about robustness, you want to know when these conditions are true when you also have when you also have robustness considerations. So in particular, you want to know when the minimum singular value is at least inverse polynomial. Okay, but you want you need to have the right kind of language to argue about these things. Uh, you know, this I mean, these kind of concepts from algebraic geometry is not quite sufficient to argue about whether the minimum singular value is at least inverse polynomial or not. And perhaps the right way to think about it, and this is maybe the main message I want to get out of this talk, I want you to get out of this talk, is that you should use smooth analysis. Okay, so smooth analysis is a very nice, um, beautiful framework that was introduced by Spielman and Teng in 2000. Uh, they used it to explain why the simplex algorithm that people use a lot in practice works very well, even though in the worst case, um, it's known to have these instances where it takes exponential time. And the way they... What, what does smooth analysis do? You basically don't actually analyze the given instance. You analyze a small random perturbation of the given instance. Okay, and you try to show that your algorithm works with high probability over the random perturbation. Okay, so really, if you do get good smooth analysis guarantees, it tells you that, you know, like your bad instances are isolated, like in this figure, the right figure that I've shown, drawn. Okay. Now, these kind of smooth analysis guarantees are much stronger than, you know, average case guarantees. So another way of trying to argue that, you know, this minimum signal value is low bounded is to think about a natural distribution over instances, like maybe random, the factors are random, okay? And then you can try to show that with high probability, the minimum signal value is at least something, at least inverse polynomial. But that's not of the same flavor because, you know, you don't know what a natural distribution for, you know, you have instances is particularly if it comes from maybe a learning setting or so. So if you just think about the components as being randomly chosen, you can actually have a huge chunk of instances where maybe your distribution just puts in a small mass, okay, like this figure on the left. Whereas if you do show good smooth analysis guarantees, you're really showing that all your bad instances are isolated. So you, you are very, very unlikely to hit that, hit those isolated instances. So re, the, these are, I would think of these as the natural analog of uh, generic results that you know that are there in algebraic geometry. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, result that we are going to aim for. And so for tensor decompositions, really the way you should think about this random perturbation is that you make these small random perturbations to the factors of the decomposition. Okay, so here's the model, the formal model. Okay, so you have an adversary who chooses the tensor. Okay, uh, uh, and now. Uh, you don't, of course, know the factors. But then what you're actually given is not that tensor. You're actually given a tensor where the factors are randomly perturbed. So AIs are randomly perturbed by a small Gaussian perturbation. Okay, so I call it row perturbed. And really, you should just think of this row as capturing the average length of the perturbation. And you should think of this perturbation as being very small, but it is inverse polynomial. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a tiny perturbation compared to the length of AI. Okay, and what you're given is you may also have some adversarial noise which corresponds to this error tensor. And what you're given as an input is this total tensor T, T tilde. Okay, which is, you know, which has a rank one, sort of rank R decomposition in terms of these perturbed factors plus some error tensor. Okay, and your goal is to come up with an algorithm that has a low rank decomposition with high probability over this random perturbation. Ideally, you want exponentially small failure probability, and you want your runtime recovery error and everything to be to have only polynomial dependence in n and polynomial dependence in one over rho, where rho is the magnitude of the perturbation. So if you think of rho as being inverse polynomial, everything will be polynomial. Running time will be polynomial, recovery error, uh, robustness will, I mean, it's robust to inverse polynomial amount of error, and so on. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, no, but I wanted to say you have like five minutes left. Oh, wow. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, said, you thought you had another 20. Thank you. Yeah, this is good. So, this, I mean, the reason why we picked the smooth analysis model is because this is the right model even when you think about learning and it corresponds to this generic setup. Uh, 
let me actually skip. So for mixtures of Gaussians, it'll correspond to the means being randomly perturbed. And really, when you want to show these kind of smooth analysis guarantees, you get this matrix M, which is obtained by, uh, you know, maybe some kind of, so for Yendrix algorithm, you're taking AI, the perturbed vectors tensored a few times, or you're doing some more complicated things, and you want some matrix that is obtained out of it to have, to, you want a lower bound as minimum singular value with high probability. And that's the same even if you think about many kinds of learning models, okay? So the question is, can we show these kind of general bounds? Okay, can, is there a general framework for showing these bounds? And the general framework would be that you have this matrix where every entry of your matrix is a polynomial of a few underlying random factors, okay? So random perturbations of vectors. So it's a random matrix with highly dependent entries, and you want to show the a low bond on the minimum singular value, high confidence low bond on the least singular value. Okay, and yeah, I mean, if you if you if you just want to show it's non-singular, then you can use these kind of nice characterization from algebraic geometry. But here you want to show a low bond on the minimum singular value. Okay. And the reason why it's a little challenging is because, I mean, this kind of low bonding, the minimum singular value is already a fairly challenging problem. It's studied a lot in random matrix theory. The main reason why this is particularly challenging is because there are lots of dependencies. In some sense, even if you take a tensor power of L vectors, okay, even if they're different, there are only N times L independent random variables, but you have N to the L coordinates. So you have lots and lots of dependencies and you still wanna show these kind of minimum singular value bonds. Whereas the kind of bonds that are known in random matrix theory are when the entries are actually independently chosen. Okay, so let me not go into exactly what form of dependencies we have. So we, we actually managed to show these kind of results for uh, two broad classes of uh, um, families. I mean, I wouldn't say we actually solved this question. We managed to do it for two special classes, which actually turns out to up to many different setups. The first is when every column is just a fixed polynomial of the vector AI. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and you know, for each of these columns, you apply the same polynomial to different vectors. Okay, and the second is when you may actually, ha I mean, have the same vector appearing in few columns, few different columns, but the amount of overlap is small. And using these guarantees, we were able to apply it to a bunch of these kind of different learning problems and actually get robust guarantees for tensor decompositions too. So let me actually talk about just one of those results. So here uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, every column is just a fixed function. So every entry is really a fixed function of, uh, you know, uh, your perturbed vector. So the, um, so all the entries in the jth column will only depend on the vector aj, the perturbed vector aj. And now you are applying the same function for the i throw, you have the function fi. And the ideal entry just corresponds to fi applied to aj tilde. And here we are, we can actually show this kind of a minimum singular value lower bond, um, high confidence uh, minimum singular value lower bond. It actually depends on the minimum singular value of this coefficient matrix, okay? So for example, if your tensor was just x tensor l times, this would be that minimum singular value will just be one. But in general, it has to depend on this kind of a coefficient matrix. And we show that this is also, there are some examples to show that this is essentially tight. Okay, so this condition essentially tries to measure how different the different uh, functions are. Okay, so let me actually not, so uh, using this kind of a result, you can actually get these kind of smooth analysis guarantees for Yendrix algorithm, okay, even in the overcomplete setup, which is in polynom sorry, robust to inverse polynomial amount of noise that actually implies guarantees for spherical Gaussians or diagonal covariance Gaussians, et cetera, even in the overcomplete setup. Okay, and this is using this theorem for this very fixed uh, function, which is just like the monomial function. Okay. Uh, so we can also deal with, the, let me actually just take a cup, uh, cup, one more minute. Uh, we can also deal with the case when your columns have a little bit of overlap Okay, but we have to kind of bound the amount of overlap and this is essentially needed. Uh, you know, let me actually not go into the exact condition because this is not, I mean, I don't expect uh, 
to cover it fully uh, within the one minute that's left. But we can actually manage to show these kind of minimum high confidence minimum singular value low bonds, even when you know that the columns can can involve the same random vectors, but the amount of overlap between different columns is not very uh, uh, large. Okay. Uh, so this builds on some works which were known in very, very special settings, but I mean, these results are much more general. And in fact, using this kind of a result, we can actually get a robust version of this uh, FUBI algorithm. Um, so this is an algorithm which was only known to hold generically with, without noise, but we can actually show that this is also robust to inverse polynomial amount of noise in a smooth analysis sense. Okay, and this will allow you, and we can generalize this to higher order L, so this will allow you to go up to rank, which is n to the L over two. Okay, so uh, yeah, so th there are various challenges in uh, obtaining this, but it really uses these two main theorems as a, uh, I mean, this is quite central to getting these kind of guarantees. Okay, so uh, the only thing I want to say about uh, the techniques is that this is very, very related to this notion of anti-concentration for polynomials. Which, which talks about, you know, you try to look at the probability that the polynomial takes a value which is in a very, very tiny ball. And that is very, very small. Okay, this is a very famous inequality by Cabri, right? And this is actually involves a lot of uh, convex geometry. But in fact, these kind of statements are very weak uh, to prove the kind of results that we want. But uh, so really what we need to do is to generalize these kind of Cabri right style inequalities where you don't have just one polynomial you, are, you have multiple polynomials and you're looking at the probability that all of these polynomials somehow manage to be small. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, you want to upper bound the probability. Okay, and we are able to get these kind of guarantees. So that might be of independent interest. So let me actually conclude. So uh, this is, we gave some ways of getting these kind of inverse polynomial low bonds on the minimum singular value of certain random matrices which have very, very dependent entries. And this allows us to get these smooth analysis guarantees for tensor decompositions and various other learning problems. And these are guarantees which are robust to inverse polynomial noise. And I think this is a very nice way of talking about extending these generic results when you have noise as well. And I think this is a nice framework to study questions. I mean, things that have been shown generically, but we don't have robust analogs for. I think smooth analysis is the right way to think about it. And it would be nice if there is a more general characterization that we have shown. We have shown it for two specific families, which are quite interesting, but I think it would be very nice to get more general uh, um, results of this flavor. Thank you.